Now we're moving from ballet to modern dance. In fact, probably to the quintessence of original American modern dance, Martha Graham. So please join me in welcoming Janet Alber, former member of and now artistic director of the Martha Graham Dance Troupe, and Melissa Mara, uh, associate curator of education and public programs at the museum, who will be in conversation about Martha Graham and her costumes. Thank you. Well, Janet, thank you so much for being here it's today. It's a pleasure. And as Valerie mentioned, as artistic director of Martha Graham Dance Company and a former dancer during the years when she, Graham was collaborating with Halston, you definitely bring a unique perspective to the table today, so thank you. So Graham was a pioneer of American modern dance, and she was one of the 20th century's most important dancers. Um, and I think part of what makes her so relevant in this conversation today about dance and fashion was her innovative use, uh, her innovative costumes um, and the way she used them throughout her performances. So I thought we could start today by asking you to um, speak a little bit about the Graham technique and the role of costume. Well, uh, I think the essence of Graham's um, revolution actually is her approach her, her new radical approach to the body and the use of gesture on stage, which then informs her costumes, of course. But the idea that she was struggling to find a way of moving that revealed the inner landscape, as she said, and she was stripping dance and movement down to the elemental, um, finally uh, looking at primal gesture at body language, studying how we reveal ourselves through movement, how we hold our bodies when we laugh or when we cry, and um, using those movements, uh, those naturalistic movements, to inspire and motivate her new type of dance. Um, so her, her technique, she discovered that emotion rides on the breath when we laugh or when we cry. There's this impulse from the center of the torso. And she developed a dance technique uh, driven by the torso, by her famous contraction and release. The contraction being the exhale and the coiling in of the torso, and the release being the inhale and the expansion of energy. Um, and every movement in the Graham technique is uh, motivated by the torso. So there are thousands of different types of contractions and releases. Uh, and they mean thousands of different things. Uh, also important to her style, of course, was that it was the perfect marriage between the physicality and the emotional. So every move that you learn to do in the Graham vocabulary is um, married to an emotional image. The technique, she didn't develop the technique, sort of invent a vocabulary in the classroom and then go off and write poetry. She knew what she wanted to say on stage. Uh, she was developing work for the stage and then had to figure out how to teach other dancers to do it. So the, the technique was drawn out of the ballets that she was creating. Um, and therefore, when you see a Martha Graham class, it's, it's an emotional journey. It's a, a, a very... Um, fully motivated as well as physically powerful uh, journey in a classroom exercise. Um, shall I go on to costumes? Yes, right? and have costume, please. <laughs> right. Um, so she was anti-decorative. This stripping away of sort of superfluous gestures also applied to the way that she wanted to costume the body, um, to the music she chose, uh, she danced on a bare stage. She didn't want a painted backdrop. And um, uh, she, was, she was choosing a, a costume that would enhance uh, and uh, enrich the emotional message of her dance. Um, and to that end, often needed to reveal the torso. I think we're going to have some examples at some point. Yes. Do you, do you want to do that yet? But. Um, do you want to do forward. that? Sure. Um, she, of course, was a student of the Dennis Sean, of Ruth St. Dennis and, and Ted Sean. Oh, here we are in London. <laughs> there they are. Um, and um, although she credits 
Miss Ruth and, and Ted for her great love and, and um, of fabric and her knowledge of fabric. She was really turning away from this idea that the fabric is a decoration. Um, she told me that sometimes Miss Ruth would just get herself into a fabulous costume and have pictures taken and then she would have to make up the dance afterwards <laughs> after she had created the poster. Where for Martha it was quite the opposite. Um, and in this stripping away, something like Lamentation, where a, a radical dance from 1930, the dancer is seated the whole time. We don't see her arms and legs. She's encased in this tube of stretched jersey, which just accentuates the torque, uh, the wrench of pain in this Lamentation, uh, four-minute dance from 1930, which kind of changed everything. Um, and certainly, uh, speaks to the sort of the essences of her costuming, that it was a part of the body and a part of this emotional expression she was going for. The costume for Lamentation, this jersey too, and you know, she sits in it and it expresses, I'm sorry, it expresses this tension between the body and the movement um, was very radical in its time, wasn't it? How was it received? Oh, <laughs> you know, Martha had one or two champions who kept her going. She tells a story about uh, Lamentation that a woman came backstage and had been crying, obviously had been crying, and said, Miss Graham, you'll never know what you've done for me. Um, I witnessed my son killed uh, by a truck, and I haven't been able to cry until I saw Lamentation and told me that grief had dignity. But the critics at the time were saying something like, well, when I see Martha Graham dance, I'm afraid she's going to give birth to a cube. Yes. <laughs> Which, you know, you can, t I always like to tell that joke after people see Lamentation. I thought we could go through the defining characteristics of Graham's costuming. So here she is. Um, Primitive uh, Mysteries from 1931. She was very insi inspired by the rituals of the American Southwest and made her own ritual. Hymn to the Virgin, this section is. Um, the idea of revealing the torso, you can see that the, the chorus women um, basically have a leotard top, but the front of their skirt dips down almost to the pubic bone so that the entire contraction that they are not showing you in this particular photo can be revealed. You can see the expression of the torso. Um, and Graham's costume, um, so luminous and white against the sea of dark blue chorus members, and um, always reminds me of O'Keeffe paintings, flower petals. It's a very um, womanly costume, I think. Well, and she had said also, I think I read in her autobiography, that the dress itself was inspired by a cactus blossom. So it, it wasn't, you know, there's that flower reference. It's definitely there. My fa one of my favorite costumes, uh, Imperial Gesture. Yes, and a beautiful reconstruction of this is in the exhibit. Um, Imperial Gesture from 1935 was Graham's statement about the death of imperialism, um, and she became imperialism in this solo by a, 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 for herself and used the, the excess of fabric to um, talk about excess and um, this skirt that she invented that actually drapes onto the floor uh, several inches. It's, it's not, um, it doesn't hit her ankle. You, well, you can see it in some of these photos. So she could flourish it, it became, um, flag banners, um, it, it became, uh, of course, a cape and wings, and, and finally, uh, she becomes so enveloped in it that she disappears. Uh, very, you know, very many evocative images, and yet in Graham's abstract style, it would not have been um, a sort of obvious flag waving or anything like that. <laughs> Spring. We, we chose this one because, um, you know, all of these things are really about the body. Ma Martha had such a reverence for the body. She talked about the miracle of the small bones in our hands and our feet. And she often wanted costumes that reveal, of course, revealed the torso, but also revealed the shape of the woman. 
if we were showing you the front of this Appalachian Spring Bride, she's very much sort of a pillar. It's not an A-line full skirt in the front, but in order to accommodate the movement, she's got this gathered tail. And this uh, occurs over and over again in Graham's costumes, and in fact, our dancers' rehearsal skirts are single pieces of fabric that are just, they just grab the fabric, bring it around to the back, and pin it together, and all the excess fabric goes to the back, so they've got this tail. Um, in Appalachian Spring, the bride uses it to great effect, to flirt with the husband and that sort of thing. In some of the other ballets, um, Eve in Embattled Garden and Lilith, the uh, Adam's first wife, it's a very sort of highly erotic uh, comedy that Graham did. They're able to swish their tails just the way you would swish your tail in a very animalistic and sexual way. Um, so I think that's one of, she, Martha would often just take a piece of fabric and drape it on you, pull things here, wrap things around. We have a beautiful dress of hers um, from Judith, which is bright red, and we've had an archivist looking at these lately. And she said, you know, it had probably eight darts uh, on each side, seams on each side. It has a zipper, it's, it's got a tail, it's very complicated. But this archivist said, you know, this is one piece of fabric. And Martha had just wrapped it around her body and then pinned it the way she wanted it to fit her and, um, and made it a fabulous costume. Yes. Well, and I think it's also important to point out um, the she was very specific, wasn't she? Like, everything on that costume was there for a purpose. Um, and I've read stories from former dancers of hers talking about, you know, how she would make alterations just minutes before they were about to go on stage. And, and she was a perfectionist when it came to her costuming, wasn't she? She was because, and I, I believe it's because um, she, through the mentorship of Louis Horst, her um, musical director, he told her, look, don't choose music and then decorate it. Your, your physical, um, your choreography, your movement, your emotional theme should be the center of, at your, of your dances. Um, so commission music after you know what you're going to dance about. And it's the same thing I think is true of the, uh, her work with Isama Noguchi and certainly her costumes. They were invented after she really got a hold of what she wanted to say physically, um, so that yes, the, the details, the specificity were there because she, like the choreography itself, she was constantly honing the detail to, um, to strip it down to its, its essences and to, to make it most powerful. Mm -hmm. Great. So here we have um, Diversion of Angels. This is a dance from 1948, and, and again, a design that she came back to over and over again. Um, the, it's pants and a skirt, so the fabric wraps in the, around the front leg, comes around the back, and then wraps around the other leg. Um, it allows, again, the dancer to be standing still and to be a beautiful pillar of fabric. If you saw these dancers standing sideways, the skirt kind of cups under their bottoms so, so that the, the female figure is, is very much in evidence. And yet, um, when they do the fabulous off-balance work in this dance, um, you, can, you can see their legs, you can see the, sh the entire shape of their torso and, and their crotch, basically. I wanted to include a picture here of you from your days in the company. Um, this is Seraphic Dialogue, and this is one of the costumes that Halston designed, isn't it? Halston um, uh, remade Martha's design for this ballet. He, he designed many original costumes for her. But in this one, this was Martha's design. Um, again, you can see that almost the entire torso is revealed. Um, that roll at the top of the skirt comes up over the hip, but then really again down to the pubic bone. And very um, simple, it's red, it's a bright red dress with a, a deep purple, um, I don't know what you call this, but it, around the, the um, pelvis it's got a, um, a purple edging. 
Um, this ballet, Joan of Arc, is based on Joan of Arc. It has an incredible Noguchi set. And when the curtain goes up, it's like looking at a triptych of a stained glass window with three saints within the brass Noguchi set. And the simple graphics of the costumes are very, um, very much, very church-like. They, they look like they could have been come right out of the stained glass window. Um, full skirt in this one, it's not wrapped into a tail, but again, the entire torso is available for contractions and releases. You know, the wrap dress that's in Diversion of Angels, that pants and skirt, came back in several other ballets, um, notably Clytemestra, where she not only allowed the legs to be seen wrapped in black jersey, um, but there was a beautiful panel on the inside of the skirt so that when the Electra or Cassandra uh, do kicks or open their legs somehow, they're this um, almost like on the side of a Greek vase in, in quite neon colors and black. Each queen had a, had a different applique that represented their character uh, between their legs. Um, one of her former dancers, Helen McGee, had written an essay, and she talks about um, diversion of angels and, and when they were working out um, this sort of tights in front, skirt at back costume. Um, and she was really in awe of Martha when they were working through this, um, saying that she should have patented it. She was really, you know, one of the, it was really her innovation. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's remarkable. She actually, with the Clytemestra costumes, had the added, um, she added to it to sort of sexualize those costumes even more. The, the fabric that wrapped around the legs and made the skirt was gathered at the hips and um, at the base of our spines there, there was gathering that, that cupped the bottom so that um, the sexuality of the women in Clytemestra is emphasized. It draws your focus there. <laughs> So I thought we can talk a little bit about the relationship, the friendship between Martha Graham and Halston, because it really was a very, it seems like it was a very special, unique friendship that they had. Um, Halston came on the scene in the 70s when I was dancing with the company, and um, he, he and Martha just fell in love with each other, I have to say. I mean, he was such a gentleman and took such great care of her and would send cars for her and dress her, of course, make um, not only when she went off to a wonderful gala, but her rehearsal wear. He made her simple silk pants and a, and a tunic uh, that she would wear. Um, so he really took wonderful care of her. And um, along with the costume collaboration, which we can talk more about, I think he saved her in a way. He came into her life just as she was having to accept the fact in her late 70s that she would never be on stage again. And um, uh, she found, with his help, um, she became sort of part of this new celebrity culture in America. People Magazine came into being and um, she did a black glamour ad, what becomes a legend most. Oh, and yes. Halston would take her to Studio 54 with Truman Capote and of course Betty Ford who had danced with her as a young woman was in the studio quite often. Jackie O would come to visit Alexander Calder and um, she was able to, with his help and glamour because she couldn't have afforded it otherwise, um, she was able to be a glamorous celebrity and I think it allowed her to continue to create for another 20 years. Well, and, you know, they both understood fabric. They both um, valued an integrity of materials. And, you know, from all the research that I've done, it seems like they really met on this plane, and they both admired one another. Um, you know, I'll fast forward a little bit in the slides. This was one of the images that Valerie showed this morning. Um, this is one of those original costumes that Hals uh, Halston designed for one of Graham's ballets um, from Tangled Night. Right, and you can see what they've done here is reverse the tail skirt so that the tail is in the front of this, also liberating the dancer's legs. Um, Graham 
Noguchi, Halston, they were fascinated with snakes. I did the ballet Lucifer with Halston um, and had a snake headdress and a snake prop that I used and that sort of thing. But um, um, he would, Martha would, as she did with all of us when she began a new ballet, I like to think she kind of hypnotized us. Um, she would bring in beautiful art books and show us images. She would often bring in poetry. And um, uh, mostly I remember the, the art that she would bring. And um, at a certain point, we'd all be warmed up and want to say, OK, just tell us how high you want our legs to go. Um, but she wanted to talk, and she wanted to get inside of a world. And um, as I gained a little maturity, I realized that, that she did it with it, Noguchi, and she did it with Halston. She was getting us all invested and all helping us all enter her world. And then she was smart enough to sort of send us off and say, see what you can do. Um, she would assign Peter Sparling and I to go and, and improvise and play with a duet that we would bring back to her and she would shape it and make it harder usually and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and Isama Noguchi would come back with a mock-up of a set and Halston would come back with sketches. And um, she was almost always delighted. Um, she, she really... Um, Isamu said when Martha says, let me think about it, he knew that she didn't like it. <laughs> um, so, but she was, she was a great collaborator and I, and I think um, created an atmosphere where um, there was mutual respect and, and it allowed the creativity to flow. So as you can see, Halston discovered her love of the body, um, this nude unitard underneath the, the skirt, um, and the sexuality of the snake images and that tail that wraps around to the front. And do you know how their collaborative process went? I mean, I, I know that um, that you guys would come in and perform for Halston, right? And do a run through of the dance in front of him. Um, and and then, you know, he would do some sketches. And can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Yeah, he would he would visit quite often. And, and as I say, it, you know, he was often part of the early discussion of just what was going to happen. Um, but uh, he would come in and often bring fabric, and, and Martha would ooh and ah and just drool over the, the quality of the fabric that he could bring. And uh, I think they often would actually, she'd go over to his showroom, and, and they'd just sort of lay out these wonderful things for her to look at and choose from. Um, and then he would go back to, she would say yes, no, and they'd look over the sketches and that sort of thing, and he would go back to his studio, and we would go there for costume fittings quite often. Um, and, um, you know, it was always a, a great luxury to go into his, his studio. Martha, Martha, by that time, was quite arthritic. Her hands kind of went sideways, but she would still try to, to grab a pinch of fabric. She couldn't quite describe what she wanted, and Halston would be right there, and his minions would be right there with pins and um, the wherewithal to kind of uh, allow her to play and, and fix it and get those details that she no longer could do herself. Well, and Halston had said in an interview that, um, you know, he was talking about how much he admired Martha Graham, and he would say, you know, that she never wanted to inhibit his creativity. Um, and he would say, but I'm constantly looking to her for inspiration. She knows so much. I, I have her, her, her counsel here. Um, and she didn't want to kind of touch that. Um, she gave him a lot of freedom, which was really interesting considering how important the costumes were to her. Um, so, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Halston, I, I do remember Halston asking us, he was doing a bathing suit line, and um, he had several of us show us. At that time, we were, were in leotards outside of our tights, very unchic these days. But we would roll up the edge of the leotard as high as we could to make our legs look longer. Mm -hmm. And Pat Cleveland was there, one of his models, in one of his new swimsuits. And he had a couple of us show us how high we would roll our leotard, what line we liked best, and had his minions working that uh, for his swimsuit line.
Yes, Halston and his Halstonettes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, one of the, I think it was Agnes DeMille, and she had wrote, she wrote that um, Halston had really altered the entire pictorial aspect of Graham's ballets, that his thumb mark was on every ballet. Um, and I think that's really, again, as I was saying before, a testament to how much she trusted him, how they influenced one another. Um, and I think Halston, too, was really inspired by Graham's world of dance. Um, and this image speaks to that, certainly. In 1977, he did a collection where he did all these bodysuits. Um, he did them in cashmere and wool and silk. Um, and he boasted that they gave the body absolute freedom. Um, but again, it's you know inspired by that world. Um, and there's Pat Cleveland in the the red bodysuit in the front. He called them body sweaters, um, and he called that color hothouse red. <laughs> and just looking at another way that, you know, Halston was inspired by Graham's world, here's from that same year, um, one of those body sweaters that he paired with an ultra suede overskirt. Um, and it really bears a striking resemblance to Graham's costume from Imperial Jester. So this was that Black Glamour ad that you were referring to before that she starred in um, with Rudolf Nureyev and Margot Fontaine. Um, and I, I guess, you know, you made this point about, you know, her relationship with Halston gave her this, you know, the fact that he was doing these costumes for her gave her this life after she could no longer perform. Um, and I'm just... I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more about her relationship to the culture of celebrity at the time, because she's really celebrated as an icon at that time. Yeah, I think she had lived long enough that people began to have a perspective on what she had actually done in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And since she was no longer on the stage um, and uh, still dancing or trying to dance and create um, new works. There, there was a real appreciation for, the, for that earlier era. Um, and she stepped right into it. I mean, she, Martha Graham was a woman of the theater. She was, um, because she was able to read people's body language so well, because th that's what she had based her entire artistry on, um, she was very facile at, um, well, as a director, she just knew exactly how to push your buttons uh, as a dancer, but she'd sit down at a gala and walk away with a $50,000 check from somebody she was sitting next to. So, you know, she had that kind of interaction. Um, I was lucky enough to dance at the White House. Part, part of this added celebrity of the 70s was that Betty Ford was in the White House and had danced with Martha. Um, and it was, of course, a grand evening uh, with uh, red carpet and flags, and uh, we were riding back to the hotel after the event, and she was snuggled down in her fur coat, and she said, you know, as I walked down that red carpet and looked at all those uniforms and those flags, all I could think of was, oh, if only my mother could see me now. <laughs> it, was, it was sort of surprisingly human. For, to, for Martha to say something like that, that I'm sure we've all felt in one way or another. Well, she's, she's lucky to have been an artist who was there, who was still alive while she was being celebrated as an icon. It doesn't always happen. <laughs> so now, you know, Graham is certainly an icon today, um, and she's someone who has inspired fashion, inspired fashion designers, stylists, artists. So the next couple of slides I'm going to um, flip through, just look at some of the ways she's inspired fashion. Um, this is an editorial from Harper's Bazaar 1994, um, and it accompanied an article that Madonna wrote um, about her friendship with Martha Graham. But here, you know, she's evoking this sort of fabric coming to life that I think we associate with Graham. This is um, Mark Jacobs' Spring 2010 collection. 
Um, and the collection itself was inspired by dance and theater, but the makeup specifically, um, Graham was the reference for it, so the buns on the head and the very dramatic pale face with the red lips. Um, and I think in these two instances also, the dresses actually do have a very modern dance feel. They kind of remind me of that letter to the world dress we, we first saw. More recently, spring 2015, this is Tracy, Reese, uh, Tracy Reese's collection, and here she cited Martha Graham as the inspiration for the entire collection. And it really went beyond um, just referencing these dance-inspired looks. She looked into the life of Martha Graham, and, and some of the clothes had these um, Southwest um, vibe to it, these prints of plants, um, which had influenced Martha Graham a lot throughout her career. And lastly, this beautiful ad from Vionnet from spring 2014, um, where literally the model is recalling that Graham letter to the world pose that was in the first slide. And once again, this idea of clothes that, that bring fabric to life. Um, so I thought maybe, Janet, could you speak a little bit to the legacy of Martha Graham today? Um, why you think she's such an inspiration, and maybe even how you work to keep that legacy alive as artistic director of the company now. I think the idea that Martha got a hold of this idea of stripping down to essences is, is something that um, ma makes her uh, inspiring, that so many people have been able to take gram shapes, uh, uh, the, the use of fabric, um, because again, they were sort of elemental and primal and, and therefore malleable. They could inspire many different things, like Madonna is doing a faux lamentation or, or this uh, sweep of fabric. Um, so I, I think that's a big part of, I mean, for me as artistic director, this is certainly what makes the legacy exciting and um, valuable. Um, it is a springboard for so much new creativity. So uh, one of our favorite examples is that uh, in 2007, um, we performed, we had an opening night here in New York City on the anniversary of 9-11, and we wanted to commemorate it somehow, but we didn't have much time or money, and we asked three young choreographers to take a look at a film we have of Martha Graham dancing Lamentation. And we gave, we said, it'll be a one night only event. Um, please just spew out a choreographic reaction to Graham's Lamentation in your own style, your own voice. You can only have 10 hours of rehearsal. You have to use public domain music or silence. Um, you can use any number of dancers in the company. Keep it under four minutes because that's how long Lamentation is. Simple costumes that are kind of purple and burgundy and black and flesh colored like Lamentation. You know, we made up a bunch of rules just to make it all happen quickly. And we got three beautiful gems of contemporary choreography, organically tied to who we are and what we do, immediately programmed them for the rest of our season and started touring them around the world and commissioning new Lamentation variations. Um, we are up to eight. Um, the originals were by uh, Larry Kegwin, Richard Move, Azure Barton. We have Lar Lubovich, we have Yvonne Rayner, we have Doug Verone. Um, and Lamentation will be um, 85 in 2015. Uh, we've commissioned four new Lamentation variations by Michelle Dorrance, who's one of the most fabulous tap dancers right now. Um, Kyle Abraham just won the MacArthur Grant. Liz Garing comes out of the Merce Cunningham family tree. And Sonia Tea is in our studio this week. She is one of the choreographers on So You Think You Can Dance. Um, so an incredibly eclectic group of artists who are all creating works inspired by this, you know, seminal solo of Martha Graham. And that's the tip of the iceberg, you know. We, it's really... Um, and, and again, I think because she was so, she got down to the essences, um, you can really mess with it in a whole variety of ways. You know, actually, I was just sitting here, I was just wondering, do you ever, you know, considering that Martha 
had such a respect for materials. And you know, in the 30s, she was experimenting with ela you know, elasticized synthetics and jerseys. Um, do you ever, do your costume designers for your new pieces now, do, are they encouraged to go explore um, innovations in textile technology and, and things like that? Yes, I, we, we commissioned new works and we're very open to, um, it, we had a fashion designer, um, a Greek fashion designer, Tassos, create the costumes for Echo, uh, a work we commissioned here, last, there's Echo some Grecian pleats. It's, it's based on a Greek myth, this choreography. Um, but as you can see, it reveals the body beautifully. Um, and we also, as we reconstruct some of Graham's costumes, we're not slavish um, about finding the original fabric. Um, we really, Martha was practical and we have to be practical. We, we look for fabric that will mimic what the original did but is washable um, uh, and practical for touring and that sort of thing. But it's, um, it's a big job. You know, we had a lot of our costumes damaged by Hurricane Sandy. They were all down in our basement. So we're in a long, probably four to five year process. We had over 5,000 costumes underwater for two weeks. Um, so it's a long process of replacing and it's careful consideration to make sure that they do have the impact that Graham intended them to, that they still serve the emotional message of her works and yet um, we can take advantage of, of today's, you know, technology and new, new fabrics. Well, and I'll just end um, with this um, since you mentioned Echo, um, when I saw the performance last spring, I saw this costume, and you know, since we've been talking today, the whole day has been about this sort of mutual relationship between fashion and dance. Um, when I saw this costume, I immediately thought of this Madame Grey photograph. Um, so just some food for thought, we can leave it at that, but you wonder if maybe the designer who was a fashion designer um, was looking at something like this or thinking about you know, the work of Madame Grey or something like that. So, Janet, thank you so much. So, I guess we'll open it up to any questions, if anybody has any questions. <laughs> yes. I have a question, Janet. I wonder, how do you find and commission costume designers or fashion designers to do your costumes? We. Uh, we commission the, the choreographer. It's, it's the artist who then chooses their designer. Um, and I don't believe we've had anyone yet ask us, who do you think I should use? You know, usually the, the choreographers have someone very much in mind that they'd like to use. We have one question here. Yes, you spoke earlier about the collaboration between Graham and Halston. And um, specifically, you spoke at one point about Halston swimwear and how he was um, using the dancers and their leotards to talk about it. Back in the day, my husband was actually um, the designer for the swimwear company that made Halston swimwear. And one thing that I remember about his swimwear that actually came out of some of his gowns, and it was, it was true in the cover-ups they made for the swimwear also, was that the um, pieces were cut out of one piece generally on the bias and they had a single seam that kind of came from like under the bust line and wrapped around the body. I was wondering whether those ever showed up in Graham and whether the collaboration came from there by any chance. You know, I don't, I don't remember if those showed up, but I do remember, you know, that they would have conversations about the bias of the material and, you know, when, when Halston was first working with us, it, uh, they would bring in fabric, and Martha kept turning it. She kept, you know, t trying to get it in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was probably a lot of conversation about it. I don't, I don't remember any one-seamed okay, uh, costumes. Um, yeah, the, sorry. Hi. Do you have that picture of um, the red, uh, the model in the red leotard and all the dancers? Yes. Which one were you in there? Uh, I'm not, that, those were Halston's models. Oh, okay. I wasn't in that one. Okay. No. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.